Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to do your reading this week and you are ready to talk about lesson one. And as we dive in, one of the things I want you to be thinking about is this question of what is God like? So the purpose of Jesus coming to earth was to show us what God is like. So as we talk through some of these stories, I want you to be thinking, if Jesus came to show me what God is like, what have I learned about God by reading the story of Jesus in this last week? Okay, so we're going to start with Mark 1.15. This is a statement that Jesus made when he began his ministry, and this is what he said. The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So remember that Mark tends to just zoom us right into the middle of the action. And this is where he starts. And Jesus doesn't mess around. He gets straight to the point. And he says, the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the good news. So Jesus is announcing that the kingdom of God has come near, which leads us to the question, What does he mean when he says the kingdom of God? So let's slow down and take a look at that. The kingdom of God was not a political kingdom. Remember we talked about evangelion last week, that it means good news, the announcement of good news. And one of those pieces or images is of a victory. So the victory of God over pain, evil, and death. That's the message that Jesus came to give. The kingdom of God began with the arrival of Jesus, but it also refers to the coming kingdom of, of heaven. So it is for now and the not yet. And sometimes this is a difficult concept to wrap, wrap our minds around. But what I want us to see is that Jesus is introducing something during his lifetime that will find its fulfillment in a future point that's to come. And that is the fulfillment of God's kingdom. So he's saying it's happening now. But it's not complete yet. It will be complete at a future point in time. In the Old Testament, um, the Bible hints at this idea of a Messiah who would come. So I want to take a look at the expectations that the people had for their Messiah and what they had in mind when they thought about a kingdom. So what they would have heard when Jesus starts talking about the kingdom of God. So they had this idea of a Messiah who would be someone special sent from God who would come to rescue his people. So there's a few images that most Jews during the life of Jesus would have had about their Messiah. And one is the idea of Moses, who was an Old Testament figure who delivered his people, the Jewish people, out of slavery and out from under an oppressive government that had turned them into slaves for 400 years. So when they thought Messiah, they thought deliverer. They thought someone's coming to release us from bondage. So that's one image that they had. Another image that they had was of King David from the New Testament, who was a king over sort of the golden age of Israel's history, so Jewish history. Um, King David created a time of peace and prosperity for Jewish people. So that's their hope is maybe the Messiah will come and develop our kingdom for us where we can live in peace and where we can have prosperity. But King David had gotten to that place by um, winning several battles. So he was also a military leader. So what I want you to hear is that they were expecting a deliverer or a king or a military leader. And Jesus didn't necessarily meet those expectations. In fact, he, he intentionally did not do that during his time on earth, which was sort of a letdown for the people. So when they're thinking, every time Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, they're like, all right, here we go. It's starting now. Jesus is going to do it. And then Jesus would do something completely different. And they were sort of like, wait a minute, that's, that's not what we expected. So keep that idea in mind as we go forward. So As you've read this week, um, I want you to think about signs of the kingdom that you may have seen. So we've learned a little bit a little bit about what Jesus did during his lifetime on the earth. So just to review, uh, we saw him have control over impure spirits. He healed disease. He cleansed someone from leprosy, and he forgave sin. 
Like these are the activities that we see Jesus doing. And these were meant to be signs of the kingdom. And what we mean by signs is that these were things that Jesus did to indicate that he was the Messiah and that he had the ability um, to usher in the kingdom of God. So these, these miracles or these signs were meant uh, to verify that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God. Now, I want you to remember that our goal is to see um, that Jesus came to show us what God is like. So as we talk about Jesus' life and what he did, remember that he's showing us who God is. Okay, so we're going to start with this story from Mark 2, 1 through 12. And the other thing that we're going to talk about quite a bit this morning is the idea that Jesus came uh, to rescue us. Remember, they wanted a political leader, but his his purpose was to rescue us from our greater need. So keep that idea in mind as we read the story from Mark 2. The people gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and Jesus preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him, Oh, get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. So I want you to see here so far in this story, we've got Jesus teaching in a room that is so packed, people are shoulder to shoulder, that nobody else can get in. So it's a crowd of people coming to hear what Jesus has to say. And you're going to see this repeated a lot through the Gospel of Mark. Everywhere Jesus went, a crowd gathered. So we're seeing that in this house. And you have these four friends bringing a paralyzed man on a mat to Jesus. And they're desperate to get their friend in front of him. But because of the crowd, they're not able to. So they take extreme measures. They climb up on the roof and they start ripping the roof off of the house. They're not shy, right? They're doing what it takes to get their friend in front of Jesus. Jesus. So that's the scene. I want you to picture yourself in the room watching this going on. So they lowered the mat the man was lying on. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. And this part always cracks me up. Okay, first of all, it says, I want us to notice they, that Jesus saw their faith. He saw the faith of the four friends. And on the basis of that, he forgives the man's sins. And I always picture the four friends standing over the hole in the roof and saying, it's his legs, Jesus. Heal his legs. He's heavy. We brought him all this way. Fix his legs, right? Um, but Jesus starts by forgiving his sins, which is an interesting thing. And I think that feeds back into that idea that Jesus is dealing with the greater need, right? Our greatest need, which is our sin, um, which is this man's need as well. Now, some of the teachers were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So I want us to notice here um, that immediately in the room, the teachers of the law, who are the religious leaders who are there testing Jesus, trying to find out what he's all about, um, they immediately identify when Jesus says he can forgive this man's sins, he is claiming to be God and to do something that only God can do. So it's not as though he's hiding. It's not as though there's some mystery happening here that people aren't aware of. Everybody in the room knows that Jesus is claiming to do something that only God can do. And so these teachers of the religious law are immediately on guard because they say that's something only God can do. Um, and so they're concerned about who Jesus is exactly claiming to be. Okay, immediately, remember we were listening for that word, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? So Jesus introduces a little tension into this story, right? He knows what these people are thinking, which is great. He's Jesus. Um, and he just calls them on it. And he says, which is easier then to forgive his sins? For, which is easier for God to do, to forgive sins or to heal this man? Um, and he says, oh, yeah. So then keep moving on. He says, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. 
He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this, which I love. That's their reaction. Uh, But I want you to see, he starts this slide with the word but. I want you to know. So he's doing this action of healing the man's legs as a way to show that he has the authority to do what he's already done, which is forgive the man's sins. So the action or the sign of healing his legs verifies that he has the authority to do something that only God can do, um, which is to forgive his sins. And the people are amazed because they've never seen anything like this, and they've never seen anybody teach with such authority um, that Jesus has. So remember, Jesus came to show us what God is like. So what is God like? What have we seen so far? Um, We can learn what God is like by studying Jesus. And here are some things I want you to be listening for as we talk through this. Jesus can't help but fix what is broken. It's like he's falling all over himself to fix things. God is in control over evil. And God is in the process of conquering pain, evil, and death. And everything that Jesus does is meant to be a signal that that's what God is in the process of doing. He's in the process of achieving victory. So when I talk about Jesus not being able to help fix what is broken, I want us to remember that the Bible teaches that Jesus was present at the moment of creation. He was a part of that process. He was a vital part of that process. And he knew what our world was supposed to be like. He knew what our experience was supposed to be like. Uh, He had the vision of what the world was like before pain, evil, and death were ever a thing. And so when he lived on the earth, when he's walking around and encountering pain, evil, and death, I just picture him as being so frustrated, like, this is not what it was meant to be like. It's not supposed to be this way. And it's like he cannot stop himself from trying to do something about that. Um, He couldn't help but try to fix these things. And he did fix these things. We saw him heal this man's paralyzed legs. But the other piece of that is that now and the not yet piece of this is that he healed his legs, but that man was still going to die someday, right? So most of these miracles that Jesus is performing are temporary in the sense that they will not outlast death. Uh, So Jesus is doing all he can to bring healing and to signal that the kingdom is coming. But he knows it hasn't reached its full fulfillment yet. And so I think part of that probably made him a little bit crazy. Like he's walking around, he just is so broken by the things that he sees in the world that are not as they should be or not what they were created to be. That he wants to fix those things, but he knows that it's going to take something more. It's going to take meeting that greatest need in order to meet that final fulfillment in the future. Okay, Uh, let's look at the message of Jesus and recap it a little bit. So the first thing that we see is that Jesus is coming to say that the kingdom of God has arrived. His purpose is to announce that. And he's saying that the steps that need to be taken is we need to repent and believe the good news. So that's the action step on our part. And that God wants to fix what is broken. That is God's heart for the world, is to see it whole and as it was meant to be. And that God is in the business of conquering pain, evil, and death. Sometimes I think we get a little hung up on what we experience as brokenness in the world and we blame God for those things. And we need to realize that God is standing right next to us going, I know this isn't what I meant for. This isn't what I designed it to be. And I think it bothers him way more than it bothers us. Uh, It breaks his heart too. And that's what we see in the life of Jesus is that he is hurt by what he sees as being less than what he meant it to be. Um, so he's doing all he can uh, to, re- to fix broken things. Okay, and what I mean by the word repent is, or what I think the Bible means by the word repent, is the need to be honest about our brokenness 
and our need for healing. And we'll see this contrast again and again. You've got people who realize that they are broken and need healing. And then you have other folks who seem more focused on their ability to fix themselves um, or who are in complete denial about their need to be fixed at all. Um, So there's that contrast. And then also believe the good news that God has a plan for Jesus to fix broken things. That's what we mean when we talk about repent and believe. Repent, it just means acknowledge that you're broken. Be honest about that. And believe means trust that God is doing um, through Jesus something that will solve that greater need. Okay, the two needs. In the healing of the paralyzed man, we learn something about God's heart for our needs. Remember we saw that Jesus forgave the man's sin, which was his greatest need. Um, And he also healed his paralyzed legs, which was the man's visible need. So God is always interested in both of those things. Um, Our greatest need is to have our sin forgiven, to agree with God that we're broken, and to allow God to to heal us or to fix us. And then remember that God also cares about our visible needs, but he always, doesn't always address them in the way that we would like him to. So we need to be honest about that. Jesus shows us that he can't help fix what is broken and that God is in the business of restoring what is broken in our lives. The people who witnessed this story were amazed because they had never seen anything like this before. And they knew that it was good news. And I hope you have learned something this week that was good news for you too. I'm going to pray and then you all can go to your groups to talk about this some more. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you can't help yourself but fix things that are broken because all of us are broken. Um, And I thank you that you call us to be honest about that and that you offer a solution to that. And I thank you that you um, didn't always meet our expectations for what a Messiah would be, but that you were willing to always be obedient to God and to God's expectation for the Messiah. Lord, I just thank you for this time together. I thank you that you are in the business of fixing broken people. And I pray that you be with these people as they go into their groups to talk about this, um, that you would help them to look, examine their own hearts and what is broken in their own lives. In your name I pray. Amen.